We are ready. We're live. Yes. Okay. So welcome everyone to this session of the core in action program. We are continuing our progression through the embodied mind chapter by chapter. And uh, today we reach chapter five. So this will be indeed the, um, the, the penultimate reading session for this semester of work. And then we'll have a, a couple of bonus sessions after we've read through these first six chapters. Um, with chapter five, we reach the area which has perhaps seen the greatest amount of change since the book was originally published in uh, the early 90s. As the uh, Giuseppe's abstract for today notes, this was a relatively novel approach, connectionism and emergent um, thinking, and the, the whole issue of emergence was a relatively novel approach to articulating and exploring ideas about cognition uh, in the late 1980s when the book was being written. The past few decades have seen enormous developments in neural networks and connections technologies, and even just these past years, um, they have indeed exploded onto the front pages and become a uh, continuous, um, a sort of a, a bludgeoning flood of headlines from the uh, connectionist uh, science in terms of their design, um, their engineering, and indeed their analysis. Um, for the purposes of looking back over our sessions to date, however, we might note um, what it was that particularly enthused Varela, Thompson, and Rush uh, about connectionism and the way in which this kind of technology enables us to explore aspects of feedback dynamics and emergent properties in particular. As a basic concept, of course, these ideas are present throughout in active thinking. And just as we have done in the past, we can look back at our previous sessions with this concept as a frame and uh, use it essentially as a reminder of what we've looked at to date, but also see the ways in which these concepts uh, don't so much as, as connect with one another as interweave. They're sort of all present all the time. Um, in the first session, we addressed what the authors termed the fundamental circularity, the inherent unavoidably reflexive nature of um, being a living, experiencing being who are also involved in a science of living, experiencing and being. Um, we noted then that if cognitive science is the study of the knower, the known and the means of knowing, then we can only do that sort of circularity justice if we try to avoid breaking it. Um, but if you break it, if, if you, you avoid breaking it, of course, it means you're you're immediately caught up with it. You're you're running with it as a moving thing rather than trying to hold it static and map it as a um, a complete um, endeavor. So this circularity means that uh, this the feedback dynamic is introduced into the process of cognitive science itself. Um, what we are studying is changing as we study it, and our understanding has to be similarly dynamic. And to do cognitive science well, we will need tools of description and analysis that can cope with that dynamism, right? We'll need to be able to coordinate with, not capture, the uh, process of ongoing living and experiencing. Um, and so there's a, a real shift to a sort of process ontology or a, a process focus over uh, structure and um, fixedness. In the second session with uh, Philippe Luan, we looked at methods of phenomenology and here are the kinds of reflexive feedback dynamics that we've been talking about requires us to not passively contemplate experience in order to analyze it, but to engage with experience and work with it um, to allow it to affect how we approach questions and to be aware that our task as researchers will involve changing our experience as, um, as a much of our uh, investigations of our, our subject matter feedback on one another. Um, so again, we're immediately thrown into a, a process of coping with emergence rather than again, trying to, to find something that is sort of fixed and, and stable. In the third session, uh, Marika van Vogt uh, explored aspects of representational accounts and the ways in which that these might can be made relevant and um, address certain conceptions of mind as continually active. Um, and it was in the ways in which certain kinds of models can help articulate some of these dynamics and feedback processes just as a as another vocabulary deployed in the, the right kind of way. But even there, um, while there can be valuable value in representational shorthands for us as, as researchers, um, our presentation noted that while these models may be valid for some purposes, real cognitive systems, or uh, what we might sometimes refer to as people, um, also of other animals and so on, but the research tends to be on people, um, are the, the product of continuing processes of development and learning. 
Um, and what seems to be a reliable and sort of consistent foundation to a cognitive system in some domains of research in other contexts, such as Marika's own work with Buddhist monks, um, seemingly stable or universal aspects of cognitive systems just might not show up in the same kind of way. And uh, so again, we're sort of thrust into this awareness of cognition as something that is dynamic and emerging within context. Um, finally, in our most recent session, Antonio Norfoni uh, shared ways in which the self or the I who's doing the experiencing as a continuous thread sort of within our experiences over time is indeed not, most likely not a consistent thing, uh, but something that is dynamic, dynamically woven together on the basis of um, organic and social and technical resources available to us in, in any given context. Uh, and so it, uh, rather than as a sort of a, a concept that we apply, it's a a running theme throughout all of an active work is this emphasis on, on dynamism and emergence. Um, so the common thread would seem to be that mind, cognition and life are not something that can be captured as some kind of full and dynamic whole, but um, understood as a, a trajectory rather than a, a, a given point or a, um, a fixed state, a kind of orientation or a way of being directed in the world rather than a just a, a way of being in the world. Um, so with that, we might move to try and get a hold of these ideas of emergence and connectionism in more full terms and uh, do so through the frame of chapter five from the text. And our guide this evening will be uh, Giuseppe Pagnoni, who is an associate professor of the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Moderna in Reggio Emilia uh, in Italy. Um, Giuseppe shared with us delightfully in the in our very first session um, that after a, a master's in physics in which he encountered the embodied mind, um, his life was over sort of overturned as it were. Um, he got drawn off into uh, perspectives and ways of approaching our understanding of the world in in ways that were perhaps a little bit surprising to him at the time. Uh, but nevertheless, after a PhD in neuroscience, he's worked um, for several years in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University in Atlanta in the USA, um, and has led and collaborated on uh, neuroimaging studies on diverse topics, including reward pro uh, processing, the interaction of immune and brain function, which is something that um, has, uh, again, started to show up within the, the text of the embodied mind. Um, social cognition, intrinsic brain activity, um, brain pain processing, mental effort and meditation. And Giuseppe is currently in, uh, interested in the application of predicting coding frameworks to the study of contemplative practices. So with, I guess, that brief reflection on the path we have laid down in walking thus far, uh, we might continue our walk through the embodied mind. And to that end, Giuseppe, I'll invite you to to kick things off. Thank you so much, Mary. And uh, thank everybody who's uh, joining us today. I'm sorry for the change of uh, schedule. Uh, I couldn't be here last time, but <clears throat> I see that many of you are still here. So thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, I think it's this one. Hey, can you see the slide? Okay, so in this um, in this part of the embodied mind, um, Francisco Varela, Evan Thompson, and Eleanor Roche uh, basically try to describe uh, novel approaches uh, to, to co cognition and uh, to thinking about the mind that uh, were alternative to the then dominant paradigm of uh, cognitivism. So let's recap a little bit what they, what it was meant by, by the term cognitivism. It was um, a theoretical framework according to which the mind was seen as a process of symbolic manipulation, which was largely hardware agnostic. That is, what was important were the symbols and uh, their, uh, you know, their manipulation, 
but uh, the symbols could be implemented uh, in principle in any kind of hardware. So more specifically, this type of approach didn't take into consideration uh, the, the biological aspect, like the, the, the structure of the brain, for instance, the, 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 the very, um, very dense connectivity structure of the brain. In this framework, <clears throat> uh, basically, the processing occurred by transmitting information from one functional module to another. Then, and these were uh, abstract modules that were specialized for a type of function. And then once they performed their, their intended uh, computation, the, the result would be forwarded to another module for further processing. And these modules were quite segregated, quite distinct. And uh, this whole process of a symbol processing and manipulation was supposed to be um, orchestrated and uh, regulated by a central controller. Uh, notice how this uh, perspective was uh, very much influenced uh, by a metaphor uh, that we could um, basically uh, identify as uh, the computer metaphor. Mm -hmm. So there is a, um, <clears throat> a CPU, a central processing unit that, uh, that gets information from memory banks, computes some operation, and then outputs uh, the results to uh, some output units. Mm. The issue, however, with this type of uh, theoretical formulation uh, was that, first of all, when we look at actual brains and we start to study the physiology of actual brains, we cannot find uh, any um, evidence of the presence of uh, clear-cut, well-defined rules and most, more specifically, specific rules in uh, of uh, you know manipulating information. There was no central logical processor in the brain. Nobody has ever been able to find an area of the brain that could function as a central processor, similar to what a computer does. And uh, even for what concerns. Uh, the memory, uh, the information does not seem to be stored in precise addresses and location. The um, information seems to have a much more distributed uh, nature. And actually, uh, neuroscience, uh, uh, that is the, the, the field of study, that uh, investigates how the brain works and looks at real neural circuits showed that the brain is, is, a, is a very, very peculiar organ, which is characterized by a massive, uh, massive degree of interconnections between uh, units. In this case, there are neurons. The processing seems to be very, very distributed. There are both short-term connections between uh, um, within each region of the brain, and then there are also long-range uh, connections between distant regions of the brain. These connections uh, change continuously, constantly with experience. Uh, there is a, a big uh, change during developments where uh, we can see uh, sprouting of uh, axons uh, uh, in, in, in several several uh, parts of the brain and then there is pruning of of some of these connections but even when the uh, main highways let's say the main axonal pathways have, have stabilized, 
the strength of the, the synaptic strength of the connections uh, change uh, constantly as we interact with the world. And then neural networks uh, in their activity, in their electrical and synaptic activity, they display a peculiar a capacity of self-organization. And uh, we will uh, talk more about this self-organization uh, quality. So uh, let's keep in mind that all these uh, um, features uh, of uh, how the brain works really do not gel with the paradigm of cognition as symbolic manipulation. They're, they're really at odds with that, with that view. So getting farther in for inspiration uh, from nature, uh, some scientists started to uh, propose um, models of, uh, that could be implemented in, uh, in artificial computers. Um, that took really uh, the basic uh, functioning um, mechanism of transmission of information from what uh, the neurobiology uh, from what neurobiology showed. So basically, uh, the first step was to model. Uh, the uh, type of activity with, that we can see in neurons. Here in the, in the upper figure, we can see a simplified uh, a models of uh, a neural cell. So this on the, on the left side in uh, purple, there is the, the soma, the cell body. And as you can see, the cell body is characterized by um, many ramifications, which are the dendrites. And it, these dendrites are the, the, the location of that receive the inputs uh, uh, from other neurons uh, via synaptic connection. Then this, the, all these signal, the post-synaptic signals that are a result of the stimulation by other neurons on the dendrite, uh, they get integrated at the level of the, of the soma. And then they can trigger an impulse that uh, travel along the axon, this uh, kind of uh, uh, insulated uh, electrical uh, conduit. And uh, then mm, the axons uh, at its terminal uh, releases uh, some neurotransmitter in, into uh, a gap between uh, the terminal themselves and uh, the dendrites of other neurons. And so the, um, the signal can be transmitted to uh, downstreams to other neurons. So what McCulloch and Pitts did in 1943 was to take this uh, basic mechanism and implement it into uh, basically a mathematical model you can see it here in the in the bottom half of the figure. So the, the x1, x2, x3, xn represent some input that then um, are multiplied with some synaptic with some uh, weights by some weights uh, w as you can see here. The, the this basically uh, this uh, amounts to a weighted sum of all the inputs. And then there is a transfer function and there is a, a threshold function. And then uh, the output is the result of uh, all this computation. So this is the first uh, model of an artificial neuron that could be easily implemented into a computer system. Uh, a little more than a decade later, um, Frank Rosenblatt in 1958 uh, basically took a bunch of these artificial neurons and uh, actually realized um, a hardware uh, device that he called the perceptron that 
computed these operations that we saw, you know, in the McCulloch and Pitts artificial neuron in a hardware, and he called the system a perceptron. The perceptron was able to um, identify, it was called a perceptron because it was one of the first model of artificial perception. So as you can see here, here in the, in the lower part of the figure, you see the actual device, the actual electronic device. You can see there are a lot of wires there. It was, you know, something that now would be uh, extremely mini miniaturized. Um, but basically, the notion was uh, that the, the idea was to connect uh, a certain number of these elementary, elemental um, artificial neurons into a network that would uh, process a visual input and output uh, a result that would, would uh, classify, for instance, this letter as an L uh, and um, you know, simple, I would say, uh, the perceptron was able to uh, recognize some kind of patterns, but uh, could not really be trained to um, classify a lot of other types of patterns. And uh, in fact, it's um, the perceptron belongs to a class that's called uh, um, linear classifiers. And uh, the the weights are changed according uh, to the to the training set of inputs uh, via supervised learning that means that there is it's the experimenters that tells the right responses to the network and then according to the mismatch between the actual output of the network and the desired response the weights are readjusted until uh, the performance converge to uh, a sufficient outcome. Uh, although the system initially seemed quite promising, actually it was quickly realized that it could not recognize many kind of, uh, of, of inputs. So this, uh, along with the dominance of cognitivism, uh, this kind of failure of the perception uh, could uh, cause the, the, this new field of investigation that is of artificial neural, neural networks to stagnate for some years uh, until somebody uh, extended the idea and uh, started building similar network of neurons, but with many layers of processing units. So the, the initial, the original perceptron had only one layer of, uh, of artificial neurons. And uh, it was shown then that this kind of multi-layer perceptron could classify inputs much better. And so, um, with this, uh, new exciting results and also with the uh, development, recent development in the fields of, uh, um, most in the field of physics about uh, uh, self-organization and nonlinear dynamics, uh, then this type of idea started to uh, become more widespread and uh, occupy a, a larger share of the research into cognition. In 1986, um, this, uh, you can see this book was very influential. It was called Parallel Distributed Processing. And it was, it was two volumes, two big volumes by uh, David Rammelhart and James McClellan. And it contained a sort of compendium of various type of neural networks. And uh, there was also the code for running these, uh, these artificial systems on uh, personal computers. And so 
I think it's safe to say that the publication of this book uh, really gave rise to uh, a big uh, increase in the in the research on neural networks. Uh, so uh, really at this at this time uh, at the end of the 80s uh, this uh, are this new artificial intelligence that was really inspired by the architecture and the functional principle of, uh, of biological neural networks uh, started to become uh, uh, influential. Especially because there were two critical issues in cognitivism that, um, that were, were kind of, uh, um, how do you say, in, represented and and pass for uh, further development. One was that uh, the symbolic information processing uh, was typically sequential. And uh, so it was subjected to what it's called uh, the von Neumann bottleneck. What is the von Neumann bottleneck? It's something that still uh, modern computers um, suffer. Uh, since you have uh, the uh, since the personal computer is based on the uh, on the central processing unit and uh, memory uh, so basically every type of data that needs to be processed need to be shipped uh, along some uh, uh, some uh, uh, information conductor or in, in this case semiconductor uh, through the central processing unit, and then after being uh, um, processed, needs to be sent, uh, for instance, to, to an output uh, layer. So this type of sequential shipping of information uh, through the central processing unit from memory represents really a kind of um, uh, processing bottleneck, uh, which is, is, is something that really uh, is a problem still now. So the more recent um, effort in um, also in um, in computing, uh, they try to in, to find a way to uh, to solve this problem. And this is, for instance, one of the uh, big prom big promise of uh, neuromorphic computing. So uh, computers that are really built not with this type of von Neumann architecture with the central processing unit and memory, but really made up of uh, uh, a large number of uh, simple uh, units that are with a lot of uh, connections. Also, another, uh, another major issue of uh, a symbolic processing was that since it was based on processing in uh, localized modules uh, that each had a very specific function, if the system was lesioned in one of these modules, then basically uh, the whole uh, performance of the system came crashing down because um, there was no uh, resilience to this type of damage. Mm. So the approach with the uh, parallel distributed processing and using artificial neural networks seem to solve both these problems. Uh, both the, the, um, the processing bottleneck due to the uh, architecture of the von, Neu the von Neumann architecture of, uh, of a computer. <clears throat> and also, uh, given the distributed nature of uh, information processing, if you lesioned one part of the, of the network, uh, still a uh, lot of, of information would be present in the uh, remaining, in the surviving connections. And so, the functionality of the system uh, could be uh, partially recovered. Uh, 
So they were not so vulnerable to lesion, these systems. Also, there was also a kind of a shift in perspective in the type of uh, uh, general approach to modeling cognition. So at the beginning, uh, the researchers were thinking that the, the most fruitful approach for uh, building a, a kind of a model of human cognition was to um, build something that could, um, from the outset, uh, have the, that kind of a, a capacity for uh, solving a lot of different problems of uh, many different kinds, uh, complex pro uh, problems, uh, but then at this in this period, some researcher, for instance, uh, uh, Rodney Brooks, who was a, a, a researcher in robotics, had the, the idea of um, not building very uh, complex system, but starting with the, uh, modeling uh, system that were quite basic, quite simple in their structure and in the type of the operation that they could perform, but then putting a lot of them together. So um, this is in the in the figure here in the bottom left is uh, one one example of uh, an insect robot. So instead of trying to build um, like androids, like robots that could uh, have similar capacity even in their action uh, to the capacity of human beings. Uh, the idea was to start uh, with um, insects that actually are extremely able to uh, do the task that they are supposed to do. Uh, while still being uh, very simple in their architecture. And the other uh, big idea was to uh, look more closely at how infant learns. So the, the really, really um, special qualities that um, infants, uh, both humans and, uh, and uh, animals display is that they can learn not by being given explicit rules, but really by exploring, uh, really by interacting with the environment in an autonomous way. Um, so, without really the need of uh, being fed explicit rules. <clears throat> so in summary, what this new approach, the uh, let's say the connectionist strategies, was to starting to study systems that were uh, made up of uh, a large number of simple units and the realizing that the, uh, the the capacity of the system would lie not really in how each unit could uh, could perform but in the connection between the units so in the relationship between the activity of several uh, elementary uh, units, which each one would be of uh, very little capacity, very, um, very simple, but the uh, establishing a lot of uh, uh, functional connection uh, in the activity of these uh, simple elements, then uh, the system would acquire uh, really um, capacities that were quite uh, uh, quite impressive. So the basic recipe of the of the connection uh, connection strategy was to connect a number of simple units within a network and initially assign 
random weights to these connections. Then present a series of patterns at the input layers of this network. And after the presentation of each pattern, readjust the weights according to some very, very simple learning algorithm. For example, uh, something like the Hebb's rule, which is, um, um, which is basically, uh, you know, some of you may know the, the mnemonic neurons that fire together, wire together. So basically increasing the weight uh, of the connection between two neurons or two units in this case, if you're talking about artificial uh, networks. Uh, increasing the strength of the connection when the neurons are active at the same time and decreasing it while uh, when they are not active at the same time. So very simple local uh, adjusting procedure, uh, not not something, you know, not not a global rule based on uh, on the symbols. Then after. <clears throat> this training or learning phase, we would see that when the, uh, we present to the system a pattern that was somewhat similar to those that were in the, pre in the training set, the network would, uh, uh, after a transient phase, uh, settle into a very specific global pattern. And this would be a representation of the input pattern. Uh, so it was not something that would be, you know, localized in a specific part of the system, like in a, uh, in a specific module in the, in the cognitivist uh, speak, uh, but it would be reflected in the overall activity state of the, of the network to the global state. So what were the key points of this type of approach proposed by uh, the connectionist uh, researcher? That learning occurs without explicit symbolic rules. We just need simple local rules and uh, the local should be emphasized. So it's just, um, it, it's just by adjusting the strength of the connection between couple of neurons, pairs of neurons, uh, then this would quickly uh, implement a learning process. The functionality of uh, an artificial neural network system, in this case, like a, a pattern classifier, for instance, that would recognize a specific pattern, this uh, capacity um, was proved to be quite resilient, both to uh, degradation in the in the quality of the input. So, if you add, we added noise to the to the patterns that would supposed to be recognized. The system uh, would uh, be able still to recognize it, and then. Um, a neural network of this type was also uh, quite resilient to a partial mutilation of the network. If we turned off a certain number of, uh, artificial, of uh, artificial neurons in the network, the network uh, would still be able to, to function and uh, recognize sufficiently well the input patterns. Of course, there was a limit. It's not like we could turn off all the neurons. But uh, let's say if the if the mutilation was was just partial, the the network would still perform well, which is something that was not possible with the um, standard classical uh, artificial system based on symbolic manipulation. And uh, I want here I want to quote here a sentence from the book, which I think is very interesting because it also foresees um, a very novel approach that I will be briefly talking about in the last part of the lecture. 
uh, which seems to be based on very similar ideas. So the, this sentence said, great attention has been given to the introduction of statistical measure that provide the system with the global energy function that permits one to follow how the system arrives into convergent states. This was a, a quote by um, a work of Hopfield, was a researcher, was a researcher working in um, the neural network fields. Another very important uh, feature of uh, a connectionist system, of uh, a system that was made up of a large number of units connected uh, together, what, what was the, the quality of self-organization or also called, uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but it belongs to the same type of, of a class of concepts of synergetics. So synergetics is uh, uh, the, the, the feature that um, speak to the, uh, synchronization and acting together of a, a large number of, uh, of uh, units uh, to create uh, uh, emergent patterns. Um, the self-organization and synergetics uh, concerns the spontaneous formation and organization of patterns and structure in open systems uh, that are far from thermodynamic equilibrium, so that are open in the sense that they exchange energy and matter with the environment, and that are not in a thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, to be able to display uh, self-organization, a system must consist um, of a, a large number of interacting uh, units or subsystem. Uh, this, these two books were uh, very important. And one is by Scott Kelso, and it's called Dynamic, Pat Dynamic Patterns, the Self-Organization of Brain and Behavior. And uh, the other one was by Her Herman Hacken, Synergetics. And, uh, the book on by Scott Kelso was more, let's say, at a more uh, popular uh, uh, slant uh, in a sense that was not too technical. The the, the book by Herman Hacken was was more more technical, but um, they were very important in popularizing. Uh, this notion of uh, uh, self-organization, emergence, and synergetics. So the self-organization basically entails a very big reduction in uh, the degrees of freedom of the system or the entropy of the system. And this manifests itself at the macroscopic level as an increase of order, So, uh, which is the same as saying uh, that uh, new patterns emerge globally, are formed globally. This type of uh, phenomenon of self-organization or emergence, we can find it in nature everywhere. It's really widespread. Here we, we see a beautiful picture of a murmuration of uh, starlings, but we can see a phenomenon of self-organization both in um, non-living systems like in vortices and lasers in uh, chemical oscillation in genetic and then we can see it in genetic networks we can see in immune networks of course we can see it in the ecology field uh, so it's really something that is um, present in uh, uh, everywhere and that suggests that really uh, a fundamental uh, quality of um, natural system is their uh, interconnectedness, interconnectedness, um, because this type of um, formation of pattern at the global level occurs only when there is uh, um, a very large number of uh, 
interconnection between uh, uh, different uh, subsystems. So uh, related to the uh, idea of self-organization is the concept of emergence or emergent properties. This is a concept that is a bit controversial, at least uh, in, the, in its strong version. The strong version of uh, uh, the notion of emergent properties is the idea that there are uh, supervenient properties that have an irreducible causal power. So there are properties that are completely determined by the microscopic levels, but nonetheless can exert causal influences that are not entirely accountable from microscopic consideration. I'm quoting here a definition by this uh, paper by Fernando Rosas et al. in computational biology. So the strong version is a kind of, uh, has been accused to be a kind of a magic notion uh, because it's been accused to be logically inconsistent and uh, based on uh, illegitimate metaphysics. There is a weaker version that uh, basically says that the, the, the feature at the macroscopic level do have irreducible causal power, but in practice, not in principle, that is, these properties are generated by the lower layers, by the lower levels, the microscopic levels, and they are completely generated by uh, the microscopic levels, but they're generated in such a complicated ways that for all intents and purposes, we are unable to derive uh, the, uh, the feature of the, of the macroscopic level simply by uh, the microscopic level. So it's a, it's a more a, a question of um, uh, practical uh, non-computability. Mm because there's a, we would need too, too, too much information and it would be impossible to realize in practice. Uh, the emergent, the, 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 the idea of uh, uh, emergent properties uh, were taken up by a researcher and tried to model the this type of phenomenon and uh, one of the most famous was one of the most famous attempt was the uh, work on cellular automata and um, cellular automata was were basically um, made up by a, a set of an ensemble of uh, simple units and each unit would behave uh, in a way that was depended only on its current state of activity and the current state of its two immediate neighbors. And uh, uh, if we devise a system like in a, in a computer by uh, suitable programming, we uh, make up a system like this, we would see that the system would uh, uh, would uh, settle into usually there will be four types of uh, attracting states. Um, one state would be that all cells, all all units become active or inactive. Another possibility where the some cells remain active and others inactive. Then another more interesting uh, phenomenon would be the emergence of pattern with the uh, with a certain periodicity, both in in the, in space and in time. So uh, with the, some spatial temporal cycles of length two or, or, or longer. And then they are the, 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 the last type of uh, uh, global state that a system like uh, of this type would reach would be um, a state in which we, 
we couldn't uh, detect any kind of regularities in either space or time. Uh, and here we can just do so that the, this type of uh, information does not remain abstract. I'm showing here one type of simulation. It was based on, 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 on the work of uh, John Horton Conway, and it's very famous, it's called Game of Life, because simply by giving this very simple rule at each unit and using a large number of them, uh, we could see that there are uh, some, some pattern appear that they really resemble visually uh, the behavior of uh, let's say a swarm of, of bees or or you know cells or uh, they, they they seem quite appealing or microorganisms uh, they seem quite appealing visually because they they appear to to resemble the dynamics of a pattern formation that we observe in biological system and uh, really the the, um, the principles upon which uh, a simulation like this is based is really, really simple. So it, it's basically a rule of, uh, you know, setting the new state of activity of one of these little dots according to its uh, current state being on and off and the state of its two immediate neighbors. And with just this local, Sim very utterly simple rules, we can see that at the global level, some very interesting pattern can emerge. So this demonstrates what? That basically, um, these kind of uh, emergent properties uh, are not limited to uh, neural activity, but are also a feature of uh, all connected systems whose state is updated according to, to local rules. Oh, sorry. So the connection, the connectionist approach uh, seemed to be, seemed to have been quite successful. In fact, it has provided some working models which have proved very effective for various cognitive faculties such as pattern recognition, associative memories, um, categorical generalization, language, and so on. Also, it is much closer to biology than symbolic cognitivism because it is based on uh, basically mimicking even though at the stage of the game, the mimicking is very coarse, but it's still based on the mimicking, mimicking the, the functional properties of uh, information transmission in new biological neural networks. Also, this type of approach is applicable to different domains, such as vision, speech, recognition, reading, and so on. And it displays emergent properties and learning. Uh, so it displays some uh, uh, crucial characteristic that we observe in actual biological systems. There are uh, some further uh, lessons that uh, we could get from biology for what concerns the uh, the type of um, cognitive systems that are implemented in, uh, in living organism. So for instance, the, uh, this, this, was, uh, this was something that was very much studied by the late uh, Walter Freeman, uh, who observed that uh, the brain response that we could observe, for instance, via um, recording with the um, electrode arrays from the from the cortex of, of mammals, uh, the brain responses to the very same stimulus actually 
uh, varied greatly uh, from one day to the other. So the very same, if you, uh, Walter Freeman was studying the, the olfactory cortex um, of the cat and of the rat, of the actually of the rabbit, I think. And uh, you will see that if you, if you stimulate the animal with the, with a specific odorant, a specific type of, of with a specific uh, molecule, uh, you would observe a pattern of neural activity in the olfactory cortex that was not the same, even though the odorant, the stimulus was exactly the same every time, but the response in the olfactory cortex uh, was uh, uh, changing every time. And so this depended it was it was uh, it was argued that the, the that the variability of the response depended on the state of uh, the intrinsic cortical activity at the moment of stimulus presentation so the activity of the brain is not is not simply a reflection of the stimulation but it integrates something coming in from the outside with something from the inside. So that is the, the intrinsic activity, the spontaneous activity that was already present in the, in the, in the brain. Um, also, some other notions that uh, we could get and uh, we could incorporate in uh, trying to devise some uh, models of, of cognition of our cognitive systems was that if we study really the anatomy of the brain, we can see that most connections in the brain are bidirectional. So this suggests that there is an intrinsic circularity and parallelism in processing, uh, not a unidirectional sequential transmission of information between distinct modules. Furthermore, it seems that there is no brain regions independently responsible for any cognitive process or behavior. And uh, in the book, there was this example uh, of the peripheral visual processing pathway. We see from the retina here to the lateral geniculate nucleus and to the visual cortex. And uh, this was the, the classic uh, description of the processing pathway. So the information goes from the retina to, through the optic nerve, through the lateral genital nucleus, to the visual cortex. But actually, by studying the, uh, the anatomy, there is little, very little support for a, a, a sequential unidirectional processing of the information. In fact, the retina only accounts for a small percentage here is 20% of the information that reaches the lateral genitorial nucleus. In fact, the, the estimate here is 80%, but more recent estimate um, say that as much as 95% of the input into the lateral genitor, genicular nucleus comes from the visual cortex, the superior colliculus, the, the thalamic reticular nuclei. Um, and then there are also regions in the brain stem that are not involved in usual visual perception. They project to the lateral genital nucleus, such as the uh, mesencephalic reticular formation, uh, the dorsal raphe nucleus also, um, the locus ceruleus, and, and so on. So, to look at the visual pathway as the implementation of a, a sequential uh, processing, this seems really arbitrary. So one could easily make the case that the sequence of the processing goes in the opposite way. And this is the case, uh, actually, um, this is also the, the, the perspective that uh, predictive processing as uh, as proposed so that really there is a, the, the recognition uh, occurs in the meeting of information that comes 
in a top-down fashion from uh, memories and in a bottom-up fashion from uh, uh, the sensory receptors. So here I'm I just wanted to quote something from the from the actual chapter because I think it's very it's very well said and very very precise. So I'm just gonna simply read this. So it says that even at the most peripheral end of the visual system, the influences that the brain receives from the eye are met by more activity that flows out from the cortex. The encounter of these two ensembles of neuronal activity is one moment in the emergence of a new coherent configuration, depending on a sort of resonance or active mismatch between the sensory activity and the internal setting and the primary cortex. The behavior of the whole system resembles more a cocktail party conversation than a chain of command. So this is completely a different completely different view compared to the sequential processing in the cognitivist paradigm. I also uh, highlighted this sentence, active match mismatch between the sensory activity and the internal setting of the primary cortex, because this is really uh, the basic mechanism uh, on which predictive coding is built. So the, this match, the mismatch would be called prediction error, Mm -hmm. And um, so there are some hints that uh, these ideas were present in uh, also in the in the book. One example of uh, a system um, that is cited in the book and that that was um, built and showed this type of uh, emergent properties was uh, um, uh, a called the ART, Adaptive Resonance Theory, by Steven Grossberg, uh, which is kind of a framework for uh, unsupervised training. And uh, the recognition of a visual object here corresponds to the emergence of a global state among, we would say, resonating neuronal assemblies. This occurs in the meeting of a bottom-up from sensory layers and short-term memory and a top-down signal from long-term memory as a result of the interaction between the observer's expectation and sensory information. This is again another hint of the uh, perspective that was further developed by predictive processing. So the interaction between the beliefs of the observer, the expectation, and the um, input from the world, that is the sensory information. In talking about uh, Stephen Grossberg uh, ART, uh, the chapter also quote this, this notion that attentional mechanisms are crucial for learning when there is a mismatch between bottom-up and top-down patterns. And again, this to me is very striking because in the in the predictive coding frameworks, uh, attention is seen as a way to uh, modulate the novel information that is embedded in the mismatch between one's expectations and the uh, sensory actual sensory signal so it's um, it's attention is a way of adjusting the precision of um, of this of the newsworthy information represented by the mismatch according to the uh, uh, believe the reliability of that of that signal In the in the in this chapter, uh, there is uh, um, the this example of uh, um, a notion coming from a Buddhist from the Buddhist tradition that is the notion of the five aggregates or skandhas that are uh, basically a description uh, of a phenomenological description 
uh, of uh, of what happens when we uh, perceive something. So uh, in the in, in the Buddhist tradition, the five skandhas are these five aggregates. They're called aggregate. Skandhas means aggregate. They are form, sensations, perception, volitional formation, and consciousness. Uh, so to use this, uh, the notion of the five skandhas as uh, an example uh, to uh, investigate whether there is a sequential or uh, a distributed parallel simultaneous processing, uh, this could seem a, a good idea. Uh, even though the, in the in the in the Buddhist scripture it's not it's not important because the skandhas are simply seen as a as a description of the of the mind, but here uh, the authors of the of the book uh, take uh, this up as an example of uh, seeing whether we could engage in a dialogue between cognitive sciences and the contemplative tradition. And just by investigating uh, whether uh, the arising of these phenomenological uh, moments uh, could be seen as something that fits with either a sequential processing, as in the uh, cognitivist uh, symbolic uh, paradigm, or uh, if the phenomenological uh, description of these uh, phenomena would be uh, more in line with the uh, a simultaneous or parallel parallel processing paradigm. Uh, and uh, they say that this uh, description could be seen as potentially as a metaphor for the distributed self-organizing activity of the brain. So that the arising of form, of sensation, of perception, of volitional formation and consciousness could be seen as transient patterns of uh, activity or resonances that are not distinct and sequential, but they uh, partially overlap both in time and in space. That means both in the, in, in the brain space, let's say. And so uh, in this picture, the distinction between sequential and simultaneous processing actually becomes quite blurred because um, this idea was actually explored by Francisco Varela in some, uh, in some of his studies uh, where he proposed the idea that um, every moment of a perception would amount to a, a rising of a cloud of coherent activity with a, a certain lifetime that then would be the, the, the coherence of this uh, activity in uh, usually seen uh, with uh, uh, EEG. The coherence of this cloud of, acti uh, of activity would be destroyed to uh, allow for the um, arising of uh, the subsequent moment of perception. So like uh, uh, clouds of coherent activity in the brain uh, uh, arising and waning, arising and waning, giving a sort of a, a rhythm to the, to the perception. So this is a part that in the, in the chapter that actually, um, I think, I think uh, was not fully developed yet. So the uh, the notion of uh, at least in this chapter, um, the relationship between emergence and sense making. So obviously the uh, the cogn cognitivism, the cognitivist approach, uh, introduces uh, symbols to account for a symbolic level or uh, sorry semantic level or a representational level 
which would be independent of their uh, of the hardware or the physical implementation. But of course, the crucial question, and it's a big it's a big issue in the cognitivist uh, framework, is how can a system acquire meaning for its symbols autonomously? Because that's actually what we do. So uh, we are there's no programmer that programs us. So um, in the connection in, in the chapter here, the author seemed to um, advance the idea that uh, this the meaning is a function of the global emergent state of the system. Uh, and uh, this uh, emergent state of the system does not come does not come about by a symbolic operation, but uh, the evolution of the dynamic state of the system through uh, you know motion through phase state space according to the to the nonlinear dynamics. Um, To me, this part is not too clear. I mean, uh, it's not clear how meaning can emerge simply by uh, re, um, appealing to uh, the global emergent states of the system. Uh, but, you know, this is something I think, maybe it's, it's not in this chapter, but I think that uh, it, it is uh, developed farther uh, in the notion that uh, meaning is developed in the uh, sensory motor interaction and in the autonomy of the biological organism in uh, uh, being able to um, act on the basis of their perception and perceive on the basis of their action. I think this circularity is uh, fundamental for meaning. Um, but at the stage, uh, you know, when reading the chapter, I didn't find this part uh, the explanation of the association of meaning with the global uh, emergence. Um, I did not find it completely uh, developed here. And uh, finally, uh, the this uh, symbolic perspective and uh, the connectionist perspective could actually be somewhat reconciled as uh, by um, viewing them as a description of uh, uh, belonging to different levels. So uh, there could be a macro level uh, symbolic description of the processes, but these processes would be ultimately embedded in a, in a level that would be um, of um, sub-symbolic distributed processing and uh, processing of uh, simple operation between uh, a number of uh, strongly interconnected units. This interaction that takes place at the sub-symbolic level would be governed by the laws of nonlinear dynamics and would exhibit the characteristic feature of self-organization and emergent properties. So this is the, the picture of the connectionist approach to modeling cognition that uh, was uh, actual at the time of writing the book. Now, we all know that very recently, uh, artificial intelligence systems that are based on uh, connectionist framework, uh, on uh, deep convolutional neural networks and um, similar systems, um, have recently they have displayed quite impressive capacity. So I'm gonna show you some examples. So when uh, ChatGPT came out, I challenged it with uh, a classical Theodicy question, like uh, a theoretical, uh, uh, very famous um, question in theology, 
you know, because I wanted to see you know, if the system would be able to handle <clears throat> something so far off. The uh, central theodicy question is this, if God is good, why does evil exist? So and I, I posed this question to Chad GPT this back in January because now the Italian government has banned the chat, chat GPT, so I cannot ask it, <laughs> cannot try this anymore. But here I will read the, the answer. The existence of evil is a complex and multifaceted issue that has been debated by theologians and philosophers for centuries. Some possible explanations for the existence of evil include the existence of free will, which allows individuals to choose to do evil, and the idea that evil is a necessary component of the universe that allows for growth and learning. Ultimately, the reasons for the existence of evil are not fully understood and may be beyond human comprehension. So it's quite impressive, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's really, I was quite surprised by this type of answer. And there's another, um, another famous artificial intelligence system now that uh, basically reconstructs uh, pictures from uh, some prompts. And so I found this on the, on the net. Uh, this this is a, a system that's called Mid Journey, and so the author here gave this this prompt that in text that uh, that you can read here with a lot of you know a lot of specification even, and as you can see, the image is strikingly realistic. So bear in mind that this person does not exist; has never existed. Uh, so one could be really, really fascinated and impressed by uh, these results and uh, would say, well, but actually, so this is uh, really where it's at. I mean, we really reached the point where this type of artificial assistants are able to mimic uh, human uh, features, uh, the features of uh, uh, human capabilities. Uh, but actually, there are some problems. Because this system, based on uh, deep convolutional neural networks and language models, need huge amount of training data, are extremely power hungry, and uh, if they show if they exhibit undesirable behavior, this can be very difficult to correct because the system has a quite, has a quite uh, black box nature. So it's very hard to then to go in the system and try to see where, where in which, which connections are is responsible for the undesirable behavior. On the other hand, biological organism are able to learn and generalize with very limited training. If you think about a child, you know, when he sees a, a, you know, a novel object, he manipulates two or three, four times, and then is able to recognize it forever. So it's, they really, uh, this is really striking in comparison to the millions and millions of training data that this uh, uh, artificial system need to perform uh, in a veridical fashion. Then another very important thing is that biological organisms are curious. So they actually, they are compelled to go out and uh, look for uh, the sensory information, sensory stimulation that they need to reduce uncertainty or to satiate curiosity. So they have a purposeful, purposeful agency. These are features that uh, are lacking from uh, uh, these uh, artificial intelligent approaches. And uh, I would think that if we want this system to exhibit uh, a behavior that it's very and, and, and capabilities 
of uh, biological uh, sentient being, they need to implement this type of, uh, of properties. So here I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, do like a very brief introduction to a framework, a recent framework that uh, I think uh, has been likened, uh, or likened, not likened, uh, has been proposed to, um, uh, having taken up many of the ideas that uh, are present in, um, in, the, in uh, the inactive uh, theory and in autopoiesis. Uh, although I, I'm, I'm saying this at the outset as a disclaimer, uh, Ivan Thompson is quite critical of this type of approach uh, of active inference, and uh, he disagrees that the two theories are compatible. So the activism and active inference uh, are compatible. And I will give you um, um, I will give you some references at the end of the talk uh, where you can make up uh, your mind yourself about about this debate. But anyway, so uh, the the active inference approach um, is can be can be seen as uh, uh, from from two perspectives. One uh, more of a physics perspective that appeals to the notions of self organization, of predictive processing, of surprise minimization, of the autopoiesis, and the other. Uh, uh, point of view is more uh, of a Bayesian statistics point of view that treats perception as an inference uh, and also uh, planning uh, and entertaining counterfactual scenarios as inference and uh, uh, appeals to the general notion of the Bayesian brain that is uh, the working of the brain as a as a Bayesian inferential system. Um, Bayesian means that it um, largely uh, obeys to uh, a Bayesian mechanics and uh, that is um, it acts based on a set of beliefs that continuously gets updated uh, uh, by uh, interacting with the world and uh, using the mismatch between uh, the expectation of the agent and uh, the, the sensory uh, signal coming from the world as a teaching signal to revise constantly uh, its own sets of guiding beliefs. And actually, Carl um, Friston is the main architect of this, uh, of this uh, framework. And, uh, Although you know it's now being very actively developed by a number of people, and but he actually uh, refers to uh, an action in this in this book, um, a very recent book, which is a kind of a is becoming a sort of reference for the studying of active inference. I'm I'm quoting here a passage, and it says active inference is in keeping with an active theories of life and cognition which emphasize the self-organization of behavior and autopoietic interactions with the environment, which ensure, ensure that living organisms remain within acceptable bounds. So quoting here uh, the work of Maturana and Varela. And uh, here uh, you can see that the theory applies the actually not uh, just to the brain, but to every self-organizing system, this example is cells and also a brain. And the idea is that the, basically the system adjusts its internal states based on its interaction via uh, specific actions with the environment and uh, uh, getting information about the environment or getting signals about the environment through a sensory layer. But the important thing is the separation between the, uh, the, inter the, 
the internal uh, states of the organism and external state and its external states by a sort of statistical membrane, which is called the mark of blanket, uh, so that um, basically the system can uh, vary its internal can get let's say the information about the hidden states not directly but also but only through the uh, changes in the in its sensory uh, states and likewise the environment and this is underlies uh, also the notion of, of niche construction the environment is able to um, reflect the internal states of the agent only through uh, its action. Here is a, another quote. Active inference provides a formal framework explaining how living organisms manage to resist the dispersion of their states by self-organizing a statistical structure, the mark of blanket, that affords reciprocal exchanges between organism and environment, while also separating and in a sense protecting the integrity of the organism states from external environmental dynamics. And uh, the one of the uh, one of the appealing feature of this uh, framework is also that it is neurally plausible. So here you see um, a, a, a schema uh, where the, the implementation of uh, the, the dynamics of uh, of active inference is um, is uh, specified in terms of uh, message passing between uh, uh, different ensembles of neuron uh, one class of which implements uh, top down or descending prediction and another class implements the ascending prediction error and uh, in this case, it's used to model uh, the um, perception and, uh, or, uh, let's say, the sockets that represent a sort of visual foraging of the environment, of the, uh, the curiosity of the system, if you want to say that. Um, and, um, yeah, so it, it's... Uh, it, it seems to work well uh, at the at the neural level also. Uh, just a, a brief. Don't I won't go into the details of the of the mathematical formulation because it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a bit it's a bit complex. But the important thing is that in this framework, uh, you remember that I quoted. Um, in, in few slides uh, before uh, that passage uh, by Hopfield that was saying that a system would uh, mm, the global state of the system would be represented uh, uh, by a global energy function. Well, in this active inference framework, the main actor is this uh, free energy, and. Uh, there are, let's say, two, two versions of the free energy, the variational free energy, which is the free energy that um, represent the state of the system, but in the, in the present moment, and that accounts for perception and action. So perception and action uh, occur by minimizing uh, a quantity, which is free energy, which is an approximation of a uh, surprise. Uh, the interesting thing is that this free energy, this functional, uh, can be um, decomposed into uh, two terms. There can be various decomposition, but this one is interesting in color because it basically uh, decomposing the free energy into uh, the difference between uh, the complexity of the explanation and its accuracy. So in perception, uh, this framework is able to account for uh, what we, we, we call the uh, Occam's razor. So uh, the, the actual perception is, um, 
is a balance between uh, uh, an explanation of the sensory signal that uh, is sufficiently accurate, but also that is uh, uh, not uh, exceedingly complex. But perhaps the most interesting thing, and this is, I think, a point of um, maybe of discrepancy with uh, an activism, uh, is that complex organisms uh, do not only perceive and act and, uh, in the moment, but are able to plan in advance their action, are able to choose uh, different courses of action, are able to take decisions, and uh, are able to entertain virtual scenarios that are not linked to the present moment, that are dissociated from the present moment. And uh, in order to do that, uh, the course of action or behavior that uh, an agent can uh, choose uh, is uh, um, prescribed by its expected free energy. With expected free energy depends on the uh, foreseeing the sensory consequences of a given course of action. The interesting part, again, we can decompose this expected free energy G in, uh, in various ways, but I think this is, for our purposes, it's quite, it's, it's the most interesting one. We can decompose into a quantity that is an information gain or the epistemic value of a course of action and its pragmatic values. So, uh, our decision-making processes uh, are performed by trying to choose uh, a course of action that both maximizes uh, the information gain, that is our the, um, the collection of novel information that are able to uh, better, to improve our model of the world, and also, uh, at the same time, trying to maximize uh, the probability of reaching our desired states, which is the, uh, the meaning of the pragmatic component. Uh, maybe um, some of you would say, well, wait a second, uh, you're talking about representation, and this is something that Francisco Varela and Evan Thompson and Leonosh were strongly against. So the idea of representation. But I think that here representation uh, is something that is not quite the same. It's not quite the same meaning. Here I want to use a description of representation by uh, Jacob Howey, philosopher, that, uh, and I'm just going to read it because I think it's very well explained. And uh, it, it helps to understand the, this notion of representation in, a, I think, in a different way. So they are not intended as explicit symbols, as in the cognitivist paradigm. So because there the issue, as I said, is where does the meaning, who assigned the meaning to these symbols? So let's, let's read it together. Imagine being charged with plugging holes in a large, old, and leaky dam. There are many kinds of leaks, big ones and small ones, leaks that persist and others that come and go, and so on. The occurrence, frequency, and nature of the leaks all depend on the water pressure on the other side, the water levels, consumption on the side, the state of repair of the dam, and so on. But you don't know anything about that. So this is important. You don't know anything about that. Your job is to minimize overall leakage, overall leakage. And uh, we may, you know, you may hear some echoes of the idea, you know, voto poiesis here, you know, uh, adjusting the ruptures in, uh, in uh, autopoiesis. You run around frantically with a limited supply of different materials to plug different kinds of leaks. After a while, you begin noticing patterns in the leaks. Some leaks are big, gushing ones, others more trickly. 
Some occur in certain orders. Every time a big gusher with jagged edges occurs in location A, about 10 tricklers occur a bit later in location B. As you learn, you might also see more general patterns. Big gushers tend to intensify en masse. You might even make contraptions with plugs, cogs, wheels, strings, and long arms that can plug different patterns of leak profiles. In the long run, you may be able to make the workings of the contraption depend on the long-term patterns throughout the months and years. This will capture long-term seasonal patterns such as droughts, wet seasons, and so on. Though, of course, you don't know that these are the causes of the long-term patterns. Eventually, you will have very efficient patterns of leak plugging, and the structure of the mechanical contraption will then carry information about the causal structure on the other side of the dam. So you don't know that these are the causes, but the structure of the mechanical contraption will then carry information about the causal structure on the other side of the dam. In achieving the successful representation of the causal structure of the world beyond the dam, you didn't have to try to represent it. All you had to do was plug leaks and be guided in this job by the amount of unanticipated leaks, that is prediction errors. Similarly, all that is needed to represent the world for the human brain is hierarchical prediction error minimization. So I think here, the really useful perspective, the, use, the useful stance to adopt is the as if. And I put this here as a, a plea to resist the ontological compulsion that we sometimes have. And here I'm, um, I'm actually, I want to thank Sebastian Voros, uh, a friend of, of the Mind and Life Europe, that post the posted the quote on Twitter, and it's a quote by Scott Kelso, in, actually in the book that I that I whose cover I showed before, and he says, "Neither the brain nor the neurons that compose it compute. The nervous system may act as if it were performing computation, but computation is just a metaphor for how the brain works." And I'm just exposing here, just exposing here with the, another quote by uh, from the book for adaptive inference: "Autonomous systems of a certain kind must, in virtue of existing, choose actions that look as if they are minimizing expected free energy." So the both representation, computation, information, and uh, um, uh, this type of uh, um, perspective of minimization of uh, free energy or surprise, I think they are most usefully uh, understood as uh, um, from the point of view of as if, from the um, perspective of as if. Um, Now here in closing, I'm uh, giving you some um, some um, references for further reading. Uh, this is a, a very nice paper by uh, Francisco Varela, uh, Jean-Pierre Lachaud, and others. Uh, is a review that uh, shows the uh, thinking of Francisco Varela about uh, um, at the time about the um, ad adopting some part you know, of the of the connectionist framework but always in his uh, an active uh, version uh, the brain web face synchronization large scale integration it's a nature of using our science uh, if you want to uh, explore uh, the theory of active inference i think the first four chapter of this book Active inference uh, uh, are very well explained, and you can download it for free uh, at this link. Um, there is uh, this uh, this paper by uh, Ezekiel Di Paolo, Ivan Thompson, and Randall Beer is uh, a critique 
of the uh, similarities of uh, um, active inference and uh, and an active the uh, an active approach. They argue that they're actually quite incompatible. Uh, and so, uh, if you're interested in this um, in this issue, I would uh, suggest you to to read this paper. There is also uh, a rebuttal or reply to that paper, uh, which is uh, this. So, uh, uh, I warn you that this is a quite uh, quite difficult from. The, um, there's a lot of from the point of uh, the physics and the mathematics, so it's not not quite an easy read. But if you're interested in uh, how uh, an activism or an activism or let's say an active approach, an active inference approach may be uh, similar or different, yeah, these are the two uh, paper that you should uh, you should read. Um, and that is basically it. So I would uh, take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. So a huge amount of material there and uh, a delightful sort of helpful walk all the way from the, the very basic principles of connectionist thinking to, as you say, some of the most recent and um, intricate theoretical mm -hmm. developments mm -hmm. in, in areas such as uh, on uh, predictive processing and, and the free energy principle. So we are, um, we, we have sort of perhaps a little bit of constrained time in terms of discussion. And given that constraint, I would suggest, so unless there is a violent revolution in the Zoom room here, that we push on through rather than taking our customary um, brief break here. Yes, um, but we have we have time for some some good um, questions and discussion there. So on that basis, if people are okay with that, I will um, throw out the, uh, the the opportunity to to ask any questions there. If there's anyone who has uh, some burning uh, desires to follow up, uh, click the the raise hand there button, and we can we can get into the, the questions. take a little time or um, as as people know if you um, just have a, a half formed idea that you want to throw it out into the chat either that we can uh, we can follow up and, and pick up the loose thread and see where it leads us once we get started if I might get us going just as um, a sort of a quick point as, as people gather their thoughts a little bit um, I wonder if I could bring us back perhaps to um, somewhere in the, the middle of your discussion to pick up on a particular term, mm -hmm. um, which has to do with, so this is one that, that shows up in the chapter, it's used by authors and you, you have it in a quotation, but is also used by Grossberg uh, in the, the title of the theory, which is adaptive resonance theory. Mm -hmm. This notion of resonance yes. is one that shows up in a number of different um, theoretical settings. Uh, mm -hmm. So ecological psychology has a tendency, well, Gibson used the term resonance a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a very evocative term that maybe helps people imagine a certain fit between neural activity and environmental dynamics. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, mm -hmm. is there a... A, a technical parsing for that term, either of, of Grossberg, or do you think that um, Varela, Thompson, and Rush might have been using it in a particular way mm. um, that is sort of helpful? What kind of resonance are we talking to? You? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure. I think that in uh, in Steve Grossberg um, theory, the resonance is about <clears throat> the settling into coordinated activity between uh, uh, between uh, ensembles of uh, of artificial neurons uh, this is something also that that occurs uh, in physical system like the coupled pendulum or uh, this is a uh, it's true that it, it, it's evocative it's true you 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 use the right term it's like emergent it's it's very evocative but it also its use may may see may uh, 
yeah, you you may run the risk of of uh, of using of adopting a term because it's evocative, even though it's a, a specific definition uh, or applicability may vary according to the to the actual uh, topic or situation that you're applying to. Uh, I think. <laughs> I would I would say I'm not sure, but I would I would think that it it has to do with um, settling into an attractor state. That that that's my that's my interpretation. Okay. Uh, so when you have a system that acts, you know, according to that displays nonlinear dynamics, uh, you may have. Uh, uh, you, it's 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 evolution. Its trajectory uh, may have a feature may feature some attractors that is the system may visit uh, with a particular uh, increased probability a certain set of states and orbit around the set of state this type of configuration. If this set of states is fairly stable. Uh, then I would think that could correspond to the idea of a resonance. Um, thank you. So the Nadav has a question here behind up yeah. there. If I'm pronouncing names correctly, my apologies if not. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering about the, the final part of your presentation yes. when you talked about uh, representation and and how kind of it, it sort of maybe doesn't uh, uh, come into these uh, predictive coding or active mm -hmm. inference mm -hmm. but I I still always feel that there is some kind of representation there in the sense of having a a predefined goal or value like if, even in the in the uh, uh, story uh, you you presented with the dam, so mm -hmm. the agent has to know that his goal is to um, prevent leakage or, or something. Uh, yes. Well, but... has to know. Uh, it, uh, I would say he's trying to preserve its structure, its identity. So in that sense, uh, I don't know if it has to know, but he's trying. He's, uh, by virtue of existing, it means that if its existence has to endure certain, uh, uh, a certain span of time, that means that effectively what it does is plugging these holes. So, so if I understand correctly, the goal is essentially kind of evolutionary, uh, you know, survival um, uh, goal rather than any specific... Uh... In, the, in, this, yeah, in this type of metaphor, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So since the since the environment is always fluctuating, right? It's changing. And uh, this fluctuation could potentially uh, represent uh, attempt at uh, disrupting the identity of the, and the structure of the, of the agent of the organism or the, uh, let's say this autopoietic system. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the system still uh, persists. That means that he was able to accommodate these dissipating influences from the environment. Uh, even though there may not be, you know, this may be at a very low level, does not need to be, you know, something like a conscious intention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also, I think that the the idea of representation, in, if you take it like this, like in like the idea that emerges from that quote, uh, is also dissimilar from the representation, let's say, from a symbolic representation in the cognitivist paradigm, because there is really a, a no central processing unit there. There is no homunculus that uses these representations uh, for computing other stuff. The, mm -hmm. the agent itself is, is a model of its world. It's the ensemble, is the ensemble of this quote unquote representation. 
It does not use them, it is. So it's internal structure, uh, you could see has become both through evolution, it means evolution of its species, and also through the interaction with its environmental niche has become some sort of representation of uh, reflection, I would say, uh, of, the, of its uh, environment. Uh, and likewise, the environment has become a sort of uh, reflection of the structure of the chains of causal uh, dependencies in the organism that live in that environmental niche. Uh, it's, it's not exactly symmetrical, of course, because the, the agent have more agentive power usually, but I think Thank it's, you. Uh, it's bi-directional. Excellent. So, Thank you. Yeah. So we, we just have um, a couple of quick questions so that conversation seemed to spark some response. Um, so we'll take them in order, but given our time constraints, if I can ask people to be brief, that'd be fantastic. Atul, uh, you're up first. Maybe if Marsha's question is more related to this conversation, she can go first. No? Okay. Um, well, I had a question about the whole issue of weak and strong emergence. So maybe mm -hmm. briefly the question would be, what's your view? But more specifically, I was wondering, is that the only alternative? Is it either that the network agency is a sort of a supernatural causality or it is an epiphenomenon? Is that the only alternative we have? Or can we maybe also think of a certain, maybe an a priori of the whole, a sort of a structure of the whole that is agent? I was wondering what your view is on this, where you see the agency in the network. Is it just the local interactions? Is there something more than the local interactions? Uh, I mean, it's in the in the synergetics um, view. The idea is that the the emergent states, of course, are created by the interaction of the elements in the lower layer, in the microscopic layer. If you want to, if you want to say that. Uh, but then those configuration exert also a top-down influence on the state of the uh, of the of the lower layers. So there is a there is a, a top-down uh, uh, causality, uh, but it's. It's really circular. It's really circular. It's like saying it's it's a bit of the, I think the the chicken and egg thing. If you want to start from the global, and look at the at the effect on the on the lower layers as providing a, a order parameters that mean that is constraints on the states of the lower level yeah, layer. Yes, but those global states are created by the interaction happening at the lower layer. So it's really circular. Um, and it's the yeah. same, it's the same idea in, in autopoiesis in, a, in an active, what concerns, uh, you know, for instance, uh, action and perception mm -hmm. feed, uh, feed on each other. Uh, yes, it makes me think of the Ouroboros there as well. Yes, yeah, exactly. Detail. Exactly. Interesting, thank you. Uh, but that is more of a vertical, uh, circularity in a sense because there is this hierarchical structure um, but still the flow is circular thank you so marcia do you want to the the last question and then we'll let giuseppe have the last word yes thank you i think it's related with this last question what i want to ask it has to do with emergence properties and sense making mm -hmm. You said that according to the embodied mind, meaning is a function of the global emergent state mm -hmm. of the system. Mm -hmm. But you don't quite agree with that vision. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts? No, I think that at, that, at the stage of that chapter, uh, to me, that explanation did not seem fully fledged, fully developed. 
So because to say simply that meaning is in the emergence of a global patterns it does not really explain how meaning is created. Okay. And I think later on it's much more developed in saying that you know meaning is created in this in this circularity really really of accommodating perturbation to autopoiesis in accommodating uh, these uh, mismatches so how the system readjusts i think that creates meaning and of course it corresponds to a certain global state it corresponds is associated but for me to to say that meaning is is the emer is this the the global state it's it's as it as it is said as it is stated like that it seems to suggest a sort of a static idea that you know global state as meaning and uh, but i think there is no reason then why meaning would couldn't be implemented in an artificial in a simple artificial system simply assign it you know meaning to a global even a even a game of life as a global global an artificial uh, system of a big number of cognitive units reach a global state but does that does meaning come out of that i don't think that it's uh, uh, to me it doesn't sound plausible uh, it, it's more but i think francisco evan and uh, did not mean that but as it is stated that that stage of the book may be a bit misleading as, as you read it like that. Uh, I think, you know, no, I think, I know that the circularity of, of, uh, of action and perception was crucial for meaning in, uh, in their thought. So at least as, as I understood it. Perfect. So, um, and, and my gratitude to everyone for being nice and uh, on point there, um, nice and quick as we run to a finish. So our time is up almost to the minute. Um, so I think we might let the discussion pause there and allow the, the, uh, the ideas to sort of continue to percolate and um, effervesce. There's so much in the talk and um, there are a lot of, of threads um, still to unpick and lots to uh, ponder there. So I will say thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe, for bringing us through um, all of that, that uh, there really is so much there. And I'm very grateful for thank you following the threads and, and picking them out with us. And um, to say thanks for everyone for showing as well the, and, and for um, the, the flexibility and timing. So we're back again next week. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you all for our discussion with Constant Kasser of um, chapter six. And so thanks a million for everyone. The, the Slack is there as ever for continuing conversations and we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Giuseppe. And thank you, thank Mario. You. Thank you both. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.